Honorable Robert Powson. Uh, that, that does fall within our committee. 
Um, I think everybody in this room understands it clearly, and I think most Americans understand uh, that infrastructure is the backbone of the backbone of the economy. Uh, being able to move things, move people, um, is absolutely critical uh, to, to what we do. Um, and you know, Americans are connected by a lot of our values and our beliefs and our system, um, but what connects us physically is the infrastructure. And if we wouldn't have had, you know, from President uh, uh, Jefferson to Lincoln to Eisenhower, or Roosevelt and Eisenhower, we wouldn't have the system that connects this country. We'd still all be probably living along the coastlines uh, if it weren't for that infrastructure to get to the heartland of this country. So absolutely critical. And from the beginning of the United States, uh, infrastructure was a role of the federal government. Not to do it all, uh, but certainly a central role of all governments. And in fact, and if you come to our committee room, above the two doors, we have two quotes up there. One is from the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Uh, and Adam Smith said in the Wealth of Nations, government, a, a government has three roles, fundamentally. It's to provide security for the people, preserve a system of justice, and to erect and maintain infrastructure to promote commerce. Uh, so again, Adam Smith, the founder of our economic system, the father of our economic system, that's what he said. And then, of course, in Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution, it says uh, that the, the, the role of the government is to drive for the common defense, regulate interstate commerce, and establish post roads. And of course, the post roads today are the, the highways and byways of, of our country. And the interstate commerce, you folks know full well about, about that clause. Um, so, so again, it's a, it's a role of the federal government working with the states. Uh, this last eight years, uh, we've seen a significant shift away from that, working with our partners in the states on many things, and you know, a top-down uh, push uh, to, to do things or stop things or uh, you know, hold things up. Uh, but again, it's uh, it's something that, uh, that we need to be focused on. We need to get back to uh, uh, to having a focus on infrastructure, which this president is doing. Uh, in fact. Uh, in our research, I think it's, he's the first president to say the word infrastructure in an inaugural address, and then go on to name a few of the modes. Uh, but again, he's been uh, he's been talking about that in front of us on the news uh, in private meetings. So again, uh, um, it, it's it's good to have a president uh, um, stand up and say that. And again, as a Republican, I'm a little partisan. For the first 150 years of this country, building internal improvements or infrastructure was a Republican issue. From, again, Lincoln, uh, Roosevelt, to Eisenhower, Republicans knew you invest your capital in your fiscal plan to improve your efficiency, to improve productivity. Uh, and so somewhere along the way in the 70s and the 80s, Republicans kind of lost our way on infrastructure, but, but again, I'm proud to say uh, uh, we're, we're back and it's, it's in the forefront for us. Um, Again, as we move through this uh, next Congress, uh, we have a lot on our plate. I just want to sort of recap on what we've been able to do uh, in the, over the past two Congresses. Um, and, and we've done it in a bipartisan way. Our committee, for several years, we became somewhat partisan. And our history of our committee uh, has been a part bipartisan committee. And it, when it comes to infrastructure, again, there's not Republican roads and Democrat bridges and Republican pipelines and Democrat pipelines. They're American. It's American infrastructure, and so it's something we can all come together. We have different views, obviously, on uh, how we do it, what the, what the regulations are, where the money comes from. Um, but again, we all want to see our infrastructure uh, uh, rebuilt, want to see it thrive and expand. Uh, but in the last two years, we were to pass the FAST Act, which is the highway bill. Uh, we did a significant Amtrak reform uh, reauthorization bill. Uh, we were able to uh, reauthorize the Hazardous Materials uh, Transportation Act. Uh, to reauthorize the Surface Transportation Board for the first time since it was created in 1995, we reauthorized it. Uh, so it's been operating under a 20-some year uh, uh, authorization. We were able to get, in each Congress, brought back to regular order, we passed a water resources bill, which historically for the last 40 years, it's every Congress you pass a water resources bill so that the Chief's reports that have been working on come to us and we say, okay, you can move forward on. Uh, we had a, about a seven-year hiatus there. We didn't pass one, and so we've got that back on track. And again, this Congress, we intend to uh, uh, to pass a, another water resources bill, which of course deals with the, uh, our ports, our waterways, flood protection, water resources. Um, 
two Coast Guard bills we were able to uh, move through the last two Congresses and an FAA reauthorization, uh, which we did. It wasn't as long as I'd like it to, but that's still very high on my agenda and we'll, we'll, we'll attempt to and, and succeed, I believe, with this president in the White House, a, uh, a uh, transformational FAA reauthorization. Uh, and of course, uh, the Pipes Act, uh, which we reauthorized FINSA. Um, the United States, as you know, has the largest pipeline network in the world. Um, and it's critical to the, to the energy framework of this country. So over 60% of our, of our energy uh, commodities within this country travel through the pipelines. And pipelines are extremely safe. I need to say that again. Pipelines are extremely safe. It's the safest way to move energy products and hazardous materials. And uh, you've got some people out in the world there that just want to fight us on it. And again, you just, all of us should be just pounding the table. This is an extremely safe mode of transportation. In fact, uh, one of the statistics my staff brought to me years ago was that you have a greater chance of being injured, hurt, or killed by a lightning strike than you do by a pipeline. And so I, as soon as I heard that from my staff, I said, how do we craft legislation to outlaw lightning strikes? <laughs> Which, of course, is ridiculous. So, you know, if we want to have a modern transportation system, we have to understand we want to reduce the risk as best we can, but with the understanding that it's not going to be perfect. It's, uh, you know, things happen out there, but getting it as good as we can, and I truly believe that folks like you, and the folks that are putting these pipes in the ground, um, they are trying to do this as safe as possible because they don't want to be hauled into court and sued. That's the last thing they want. And, and I've got to tell you, it's a mindset in this town that corporations across America, industries across America, I think there's always dirty pool going on or somebody's trying to do something. Just imagine if Boeing decided that they were going to cut corners and they had planes just falling out of the sky. Well, Boeing wouldn't be in business. So Boeing is, every day they go to work, first and foremost is they got to build the safest plane possible. That's the same, I believe, with the pipeline people. Now, are there some bad actors out there, people that, you know, do? Sure. And those are the, that's what we need government for. But we ought to let these, these, these industries, these companies, go do their business, do it safely, get these products built, get these transportation systems built, uh, because Americans all benefit by it. Uh, so, so again, uh, as we move forward uh, in, into this Congress, you know, we're going to be looking at those those types of things. Uh, again, the, the Keystone and the Dakota Access Pipelines are, are going to move forward. Uh, the Dakota Pipeline, I guess that was just signed in just a few days ago. Um, and uh, again, we need the, the regulators to certainly do their job, but part of that is making sure they're working with good players and good actors to, to get these projects moving. Um, and, and again, that was that's a goal as we, uh, as we move forward into the Pipes Act uh, and as we look at, the, at our, our, our pipeline infrastructure in this country. Uh, we, we are, previous bill, we had a lot of listening sessions, we heard from the industry, which I believe in anything we pass, we've got to have the stakeholders at the table. They've got to tell us the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, again, Rob was uh, at the table the last time and he had, he had some, some, some ideas from the real world that we were able to incorporate uh, in in the, uh, in the in the bill. Uh, and again, the last Pipes Act aimed to improve safety in many, many ways, uh, sets minimum federal standards for underground gas storage facilities, uh, requires FIMS to conduct a rulemaking uh, on emergency order authority, and ensures that, that, that they will assess potential economic and user and national security uh, uh, impacts. Uh, Pipe Acts also took steps to promote better use of data and technology. Uh, and safety through performance-based regulations, which I think is so important, I mean, not only in, in, uh, in the pipeline industry, but in, in all our industries. Really look at the at, at risk-based uh, performance, uh, and that's how we, I think, we can find, and we have our we have competitors, countries around the world, that are doing just that, and they're going faster and further and as safe as we do uh, with those uh, risk-based, <coughs> excuse me, risk-based regulations. Um, we created working groups that allow the federal government, states, industry, and, state, and stakeholders uh, to help develop voluntary information uh, of the systems. And uh, of importance to, to you, the members uh, of the Pipes Act, eliminated the maintenance of effort requirement uh, for state pipeline safety programs. 
It also required a study that showed the benefits of state pipeline safety programs and required FINSA to provide explanations when a state's request for interstate agreement is denied. And, and we're seeing that uh, in a few places around the country where they are getting denied. In addition, we required a study regarding uh, Motorization of gas pipeline transportation, which I know is something that you folks are very, very interested in. We want to make sure that we study and understand it fully before we, because there's going to be an economic impact. So we want to, we want to understand that. Um, uh, and, and I want to note that the, the mandate for pipeline safety training uh, for states and local officials from the Pipes Act of 2011 has been completed. And again, that's we talked about Rob now three times. That was something Rob was very instrumental in. Pushing me in that way, or I should say, educating me in that to see the importance of that. Uh, the, the important provision is a force multiplier for pipeline safety, uh, allowing state inspectors to be trained uh, at the FEMSA facility in Oklahoma City, uh, which is just makes sense. If you folks are out there looking at pipelines and FEMSA are looking at pipelines, why don't we train everybody up so that we increase our, our force? Because we heard there's at times over the years there aren't enough inspectors. Now we've we've multiplied that force, uh, and ultimately a strong oversight of FIMSA to ensure that we have the safest pipeline network uh, possible. Um, and again, rooted in performance-based regulations. Um, the pipe acts and uh, have other examples of our committee and Congress building consensus, getting things done, getting things done for the people of America. And again, we're rolling up our sleeves now to uh, uh, to to move forward. Uh, one of the priorities. Uh, working with the administration and my colleagues on the Hill to explore this infrastructure package. And as I said, it's broader than just the transportation committee's jurisdiction. It, uh, it reaches into uh, energy and commerce, as I mentioned, electric grid, uh, broadband. Um, I believe that, well, first of all, I, I, it was no surprise to me that Donald Trump is all about infrastructure. He's a builder. He builds things. And he can look back at the history of whether it's New York or this country, and the expansion of this country, a lot of it was driven uh, by the expansion of our infrastructure system. So he's he's pushing that, and again, I think he's absolutely right when he says we got to fix it first. What do we have in place that needs to be fixed before we go out here and, and build these, some of them high in the sky uh, systems or projects? We really need to focus on uh, what's important. And the states need to be at the table at the beginning so they can help us sell this to the American people. Uh, if you're going to do this, you got to be able to go back. The governors have to be able to go to their states. Members of Congress have to be able to go back to their districts and say, if we pass this infrastructure, this is what is going to this is what's going to happen positive when it comes to infrastructure in the 9th congressional district of Pennsylvania, so that the American people buy into it. And we've seen around the country when states have addressed their needs for funding for infrastructure. In every case, whether well, some cases the, the voters vote to do it, and they've got to get big numbers. But when a legislature acts, we've seen that they've done it. Nobody's lost an election by it. In fact, people, if they understand what they're getting, if they know that they're getting something, they're going to uh, respond in a, in a positive positive way. Um, as I said, uh, uh, we're working uh, with this administration uh, to, uh, to craft a, uh, a, an infrastructure package. And every single day since about a week after the election, I get asked by my colleagues, by the media, by anybody interested, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to wait until the administration has the folks, the right folks, feet on the ground. Uh, Secretary Chow was just confirmed last week and meeting with her yesterday. Uh, at the White House, uh, the director of the National Economic Council, Gary Cohen, is the, the man in the White House, the team in the White House that's looking at infrastructure. So all of us working together with my colleagues in the Senate to craft a, a proposal Greg Walden and myself looking at our different areas so that we come out with a, a message that we're all on board. I think that's the way you uh, have your best shot at passing legislation, getting something out there. So for Bill Schuster to get out in front and say, this is the Schuster plan, may satisfy my ego to be able to say that, but if it doesn't get done, then we've done nothing for the American people. So so again, we're waiting to start to develop this, and, uh, and you're not going to see the infrastructure package in the next month or two. The order of things will, will be you know, we're working on re uh, replacing Obamacare, uh, uh, repair, or, excuse me, uh, repeal and replace it, which we've already started that process. And then the, the tax piece, the tax reform piece, will go next. And within that, we have to figure out how to pay for infrastructure. Uh, and how do you do that? It's not all. It's not all going to be 
federal dollars. It's going to be a, a tax uh, tax reform issues that uh, take some of those tax dollars and bring them back. Hopefully, and one of our goals in the Republican side is lower tax rates on corporations so that they can keep more of their own money. And so when it comes to uh, pipelines and, and electric grid and broadband, let those corporations keep more of their money and then let's get the regulatory barriers out of their way so that you can go build pipelines and you can you can go and build uh, build out more broadband. And the railroads, the same situation. They don't really want federal government dollars because it just slows them down and costs them more. So give them their, let them keep more of their money, get the regulatory uh, challenges out of their way, and let them let them build the infrastructure with their own money. Which I think uh, many of these industries, that's exactly what, what they want. Um, uh, one of the key things is going to be how you pay for it. Um, running up the debt is not an option in this Congress. So we've got to figure out how to, how to pay for it, and I believe it's going to be looked at in every way, shape, or form um, to try to figure out how, how it gets to, uh, to a pay for uh, P3s, public-private partnerships, are a piece of that puzzle. It's not the silver bullet. Uh, we had a P3 panel, a special panel, uh, three years ago. We came away and said, yes, it's a tool in the toolbox. It's a big tool in the toolbox. Uh, but it's not it's not the silver bullet that, that some folks claim it is. But there's a lot of private sector money out there that would, that, would, that wants to come and invest in, in infrastructure in this country. But the bottom line is they've got to meet their bottom line. They've got to get some sort of return on those investments. So uh, and that's going to require the feds, the states, working together with, with their, their funding packages to make sure those projects can be delivered in, and if the private sector dollars are there to have some sort of return for them, it's reasonable. Um, and, uh, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our FAA reform, which is something that's very important to me, I've looked at it for the last 15 years, and looking at a transformational uh, FAA reform, what that means is it's good government to separate the regulator from the operator, just like we do in your industry. Uh, the FAA does everything. They regulate and they control and they operate the airspace. Um, and 60 countries across the world have done just that, separated them. And uh, taken the operations out of government, which we believe we can do, and we looked around the world very successfully. Safety does not suffer, and in some cases, they would argue in some of these countries, their safety record is better than ours, and we're very, very safe. Um, but they can do it much more efficiently and, uh, and roll out a 30 or 40 billion dollar program that needs to update the technology that, 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 uh, that manages the airspace. We're still using equipment basically from the 1950s and 60s. Uh, so it's when you go into these towers and see this and then go to Canada and see what they're doing. And Canada is also deploying right now a GPS based system. Uh, they'll be the only country in the world that will have 100% visibility of the global airspace. Um, and the only good thing about the Canadians doing it, it's not the Chinese or the Russians doing it. Uh, so again, uh, we have a friend that's doing it. So we, we've got to we've got to modernize the, uh, the 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 FAA and and again also make sure that what's left back in government, the regulatory piece, allows for our manufacturers, Boeing and Gulfstream, and the manufacturers of these airframes and avionics to maintain our lead in the world. When the CEO of Boeing comes into my office and says it's easier to build a plane in Europe than it is in the United States, that made me sit up and pay attention. If you would have said easier in Canada or Brazil or China, I said, well, yeah, those guys are a little loosey-goosey maybe sometimes. But Europe is beating us. Airbus is going to, because their, their regime over there to help for the regulate and, and build planes is a faster process, that gives them an advantage. We've got to make sure we maintain our lead in aviation. And for gosh sakes, we invented aviation. It should always be an American, we should be the leaders of the world. So, so again, that's on our agenda uh, as we move forward uh, uh, in the next Congress, uh, as, as well as again, we're, we're working on uh, we'll be working on pipe uh, safety, uh, railroads, uh, water infrastructure, again with the uh, um, uh, water resources bill. When it comes to water, I know you folks do a lot with water. Uh, there'll probably be some funding somewhere, but don't look to Washington to you know have a big big boost in it. It's, it's one of those areas that I certainly uh, believe in the need for uh, clean water and making sure we get rid of our waste. Uh, but it's, from my view, it's really the focus should be back in the states and the locals to pay for those things. But when the federal government puts a regulation out there that forces my local communities or my state 
to do something, then the federal government decided they wanted in the game. And we ought to have some, some dollars coming back to help alleviate that pain. And I come from an area of Pennsylvania that half my district, uh, the, water, uh, the water flows into the Susquehanna, which flows into the Chesapeake. So the, the regulatory, the of Pennsylvania, the regulatory standpoint, it's really hard for our farmers and these small towns. I'm from a rural area. Uh, small towns, uh, older communities, lower income. You know, when you walk, roll into a town of 2000 and, and, the, and, the, and the DEP, because of the EPA, has said, you got to redo your facility and it's going to cost 15, 20 million dollars. There's not 15 to 20 million dollars in the community to do that. So again, it, it's going to take the feds when they, when they mandate something, to be there to be helpful to the states and the locals to get those projects done. Again, I'm for clean water, I'm for cleaning the environment up. Uh, we need to do it in a way that, uh, that, that goes forward in a, in a reasonable way uh, and not to uh, go in a way that's going to uh, break the bank uh, of these small communities. Uh, again, we have FEMA under us, GSA, uh, deals with all the government buildings. Uh, and again, as we move through the next Congress, every one of our committees, as it has been in the past, will be producing legislation, and as I said, uh, with this big infrastructure package, I, I couldn't be more excited uh, than to be able to, to work with this administration to, to pass uh, an infrastructure bill that has significant, significant regulatory reform. Uh, and then push those, those, those regulations out to the states where, where it makes sense. Let you folks do what you do, and you do it much better than the federal government. Uh, let the feds do it when it's crossing state lines and, and doing what the role of the federal government is. Um, but uh, as we move forward, we, we need to, uh, to, to build a 21st century uh, infrastructure because there's only going to be more gas and more oil and more materials, uh, more people, more stuff is going to be moving across uh, the, the system uh, in the next 20 years. And if we don't do it today, uh, we're going to have we're going to be a world of hurt, and we're already seeing that congestion uh, across the country. You name the mode, whether it's the air, whether it's the rails, whether it's the, the seaports, uh, the highways, they all need investment, and so uh, it, it's something that uh, is critical. Uh, I, as I said, couldn't be more excited to uh, be the chairman of the transportation committee when we have somebody sitting down at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue that's fully committed. So, so again, I thank you for what you do. Uh, out there in the, in the real world, and I especially thank you for coming to Washington, D.C. and getting out there, talking to members of Congress and helping to educate us so that we can pass a good policy, a policy that's good, good for America. Again, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy your suffering. Thank you. Pipeline safety, you heard him talk about that. And uh, I, I appreciate the shout out, but there's no, as my father once taught me, there's no I in team. And I footnoted earlier all the people. I'm seeing Moreau's out there smiling and others. But uh, it was really a team effort. Where's, uh, where the hell did Melee go? Give him a shout out here this morning. So we're going to transition into uh, FERC Church here this morning. And uh, it's an honor to have the chairman join me here. For a little chat about the firm. She needs no introduction to this group. But, but, I, but I have to say this. I have, I have to say this before we go. She, she really knows how to rub it in. <laughs> and um, I'm not going to go there. The balls were. You know, they weren't deflated. I had a <laughs> it was a miracle. But it's really an honor to have you. So let's sit down. <laughs> Very excited to have you back. And, and let me just say this: from from my experience, I've 
I worked with you all the way up to a case we brought all the way to the Supreme Court with a victory on FERC Order 745. And uh, one of the things I always appreciate, Cheryl, about you is your outreach to the states and, and your recognition of states' rights. And, and uh, that, that is a true testimony to your leadership. So uh, with that, well, how's it going? I mean, what's it, give me a little, uh, give us a little inside baseball. Well, the last, I mean, my whole FERC tour of duty has been a little bit non-standard. Because I was a commissioner, then acting chairman, then chairman, then a commissioner again. But the last three weeks have been the scariest set of plot twists yet. Um, I was, uh, I mean, I think everyone in the room knows that um, right now at FERC we had three Democrats and two Republican vacancies. Um, a few days after the inauguration, I was named acting chairman and our uh, chairman, somewhat to our surprise and certainly to our disappointment, um, Chairman Norman Bay uh, left uh, and we are now two commissioners. I don't believe Colette is here this morning. I know she was around Sunday and yesterday. I'm Colette Honorable and myself waiting for nominations. Um, I said last time I was acting chairman in the very first minute, um, the top priority is to keep all the important work of the 1,300 people or so that work for the agency moving forward um, in a time of um, <coughs> uncertainty and transition. Uh, that's even more true now because I think the transition and uncertainty is very heightened as we wait for who is going to be the future FERC, but the work that we do has to move forward. Yeah, what we like to call doing the boring good, and uh, you certainly have done that. Um, you know, I, I look at FERC and, and, you know, obviously there's a heightened awareness now to get to get to a farm, but in the interim, I mean, the show must go on, and let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, thanks, Rob. Um, I Jennifer. said yesterday that the people from the White House should just come to Nehru and they could fill their forum, but um, <laughs> unfortunately they didn't listen to me as far as I know. Uh, <laughs> working on that. Well, first of all, the first thing we did when we realized we would be losing a quorum is we confirmed that all the existing delegations and all the existing work of staff um, that is done under existing delegated authority could move forward. Um, that means the environmental review of projects, the audits, the investigations, the 5,000 delegated orders a year, and uncontested cases or smaller cases that staff does. And one thing I want to highlight, um, something that's somewhat of a less well-known role of FERC. We do have five regional offices that are responsible for dam safety of all the dams we regulate. And right now, an extraordinarily high profile and um, critical situation at the Oroville Dam in California. We have people there 24 seven from our San Francisco office, as well as our Washington DC office, um, working with state officials and the California Department of Water Resources to protect public safety. And uh, our head of projects, uh, Ann Miles, is retiring next week, unfortunately, and she said this is the most serious situation she's seen in her 30-year career. So she's unfortunately going out with little drama. But the most important thing is to keep the people safe while they repair the dam and then move forward. You know, I've, I've always appreciated, again, your leadership. And, and look, and, you, know, you might be the acting chairman, but I know you not to be a wallflower. You like to get things done. And, and so let's talk about some of your priorities here. Uh, well, and I, I do plan to stay on the commission afterwards, so I'll be able to continue to help push my priorities with my new colleagues and my, hopefully my existing colleague, Colette. Um, when I came to the commission, I put on my website that my top three priorities were reliability and grid security, um, transmission, and building a clean and diverse energy mix, and that really hasn't changed, although there's been a lot of changes in the resource mix. Um, really, over the last several years, a lot of our work has been driven by changes in the resource mix, the build out of the natural gas pipeline system and the use of gas for generation, all the renewable storage and demand side resources are shaping a lot of our work, both on market rules and on infrastructure. Um, one issue that's very prominent right now and that I, I hope we can make progress on during our period of not having a forum is the uh, <coughs> critical issue of how the wholesale competitive markets can adjust or be adapted to various state initiatives to choose resources. Um, we have a situation where in big parts of the country, the uh, vertically integrated re uh, companies were 
um, disaggregated and their merchant generation needs an investment signal to keep the lights on in the markets. We have a lot of states for various reasons enacting policies to specifically choose resources and we have several cases pending um, that raise those issues. Uh, while, we can't, while we can't issue orders in those cases, one thing that um, Colette and I have talked about that we can do is to um, organize a staff-led tech conference to bring people in before us, build a record, take hear from the states, from the environmental community, from others who, from the generators and the ISOs, to try to discuss some of those issues. So that's something we are hoping to do. Can we, we talk just to little... announce something at NARU, so we, you know. We talked a little bit about that yesterday in our panel. You have the chairman and CEO of Exelon here, and you know, one of the largest nuclear operators yes. in the country. And, um, you know, they're, they're facing some big challenges, and, and without the state like mechanisms, how are these nuclear plants going to survive? And, uh, you know, as you talk about, uh, you know, diversity in our fuel mix, and uh, it's nice that I have 500 trillion cubic feet of gas to share with the world, but as Tom Fanning would say, we couldn't put all our retirement savings in Apple. So, having that discussion about fuel diversity and price formation um, is, is really probably first and foremost. Yes, we can't, I, mean, I can't talk too specifically because we have um, complaints pending both in PGM with the Illinois statute and in New York where they also have the zero emissions credits. Um, but uh, first of all, a couple of years ago, um, both the PGM and the ISO New England markets made changes in their capacity markets to try to make sure they were properly rewarding the resources you could always count on to be there when most needed with the capacity performance and paper performance. Um, the nuclear resources were front and center in those resources that are baseload, that are there whenever you need them. And um, But uh, what the markets do not currently do is compensate nuclear resources for their carbon-free attributes. The markets weren't designed to do that, and that's something the those state programs are seeking to do it. As I said, those are things we have to um, work out. I, I think we only have three choices here. Uh, one is to, for the stakeholders and the ISOs and FERC to somehow have a design solution that retains the benefits of the competitive markets for customers, but in a way that adapts to some of these state issues. That's kind of door one. Door two is we can litigate it out. I loved winning the case in the Supreme Court, but litigation is never my first choice for how we resolve things. And door three is some kind of gradual re-regulation, um, which I think if the states want to re-regulate, that's fine. But I'm concerned that we'll have unplanned re-regulation um, as the markets just get cannibalized and we lose some of the reliability benefits for customers. So door one of making a decision to work this out and adapt the markets is by far the best solution, and we'll need the help of all the smart people in this room to do that. Speaking of smart people, it's nice to see our RTO leadership step up on this issue, and I'm proud of uh, our, our RTO leader, Andy Ott, and having this conversation, and, and the New England ISO. So uh, speaking of New England, not the Patriots here this morning, of course. <laughs> I have a panel next My to cyber. My shirt speaks for itself. Yeah, I have a panel on cyber, and I know Morose is he's kind of an Eagles fan, and I got former U.S. That was Senator. a different Super Bowl. Watersheds. So let's get beyond that. And how are you facing 
I call it this this rogue attack by by the environmental community to site pipelines. Well, we we have had a tremendous um, inflection point up of our pipeline grid as with the new extraction methods that you're well aware of in Pennsylvania, we've needed pipelines to bring gas to market from regions. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, pipelines came from, uh, I mean, I was born slightly after they had to manufacture it because the technical <laughs> pipeline came in 52. But um, the, pipe, the gas came from Texas up to the Northeast. Now gas is coming from the Marcellus and a lot of the other shale places, so we're building out, people are building out the pipeline grid to bring that gas to market. Um, what we're seeing in our pipeline dockets is that uh, people are bringing, uh, we have to, under the National Environmental Policy Act, consider environmental issues, make sure there's need, consider that the pipelines are done in an environmentally responsible way before, if they are to be built. But in some cases, our dockets are being used as a place to discuss larger issues of should we extract gas at all, um, how should we handle climate change is being discussed in a specific docket on adding compression in one station, and that's a difficult forum to have that discussion. Um, we are trying to take seriously all the comments we have in the docket, but I think the people who want to stop fracking, I said, when well, this is where Harrisburg, Pennsylvania is now. All kidding aside, <laughs> we don't regulate that, and there are places where they should be having their voices heard. Well said, and in, in, in recognition of that, I think, you know, we're, we're looking at an at a, at a unbelievable scenario unfolding when we talk about the energy renaissance in this country. We're obviously at the forefront of it. 2008, we're an import nation of natural gas, and today, you know, we have all these LNG export facilities, for example, Code Point on the eastern seaboard, um, Sabine Pass with Schneer Energy. So your thoughts on LNG and, and where we're headed? So, I mean, yes, I shouldn't admit this, but on Sunday I played hooky for a little while and took a walk with my husband over to the National Portrait Gallery. And um, they had a they have a video screen with video of all the presidents, and the one they have of President Carter, he's saying it's well known that we're running out of energy in this country. There's no dispute about that, etc. And now you just look at the transformation. Um, LNG had has been an important um, import commodity that helped um, keep people warm in the winter. Um, where I'm from, I'm looking at Angie O'Connor, is where it's still being imported up in Boston. Um, but now what we're seeing is that with the um, growth of the affordable and abundant domestic natural gas, people in other parts of the world are looking to buy U.S. gas. And there we have split authority with the DOE. They oversee the actual export of the product, but we oversee the regulation and construction of the export facilities. And we have seen, uh, I mean, when I was nominated in 2010, I prepared for my hearing answering a lot of questions on LNG import. By nine months later, it had flipped on the dime. You also, your, your career, you, you, you were a utility executive, and uh, so, so let's, let's get into my favorite subject, and I call it PURPA 2.0. 1978, President Carter puts an edict down, as you mentioned, uh, where, where, where we have resource uh, scarcity. Yeah, obviously, uh, I, was, I didn't have a driver's license at the time, so, but we had cars lined up, and we were rationing fuel sources. We couldn't use natural gas to build a power plant. So look at PURPA in our world, in this state public utility commissioners in your world as a, as a FERC regulator. Is it time for Congress to really roll up the sleeves and modernize PURPA to recognize the 21st century uh, energy landscape? I know well, that's I, was, I mean, I was around in the late 80s when we, in Massachusetts, we actually wrote out the first PURPA contract. And it was very much like tiny little um, renewables um, <coughs> making a contract with a big bad utility. I mean, it was just a different, whole different industry than we have now. But um, one thing we're very mindful of as we administer PERPA at FERC is as recently as 2005, Congress reopened PERPA and made changes with the uh, application of PERPA in the competitive market regions, but left it in place in the other regions of the country. And so a lot of the people who come before us who want PERPA 
uh, want changes, we said those are really legislative changes. I, I think that um, there are a lot of drivers right now of renewable generation, the incredibly improved economics, um, other environmental requirements like the renewable portfolio standards, tax credits, and so forth. And I think it, it would probably be a time when Congress can look at FERPA again and see if they want to make any changes. It's no longer the dominant driver, but we did hear when we had our FERPA tech conference, it is still the driver for some projects, um, but there are a lot of other drivers as well. You know, we, uh, we've been blessed with your leadership and then prior Chairman Bay uh, working with one of your key team members, and that's Joe McClellan on cyber. We're going to have a panel here next. But as you look at, at cybersecurity, again, and from the lens of a former utility executive to acting FERC chair, you know, advice and counsel for the states going forward. And let me just commend you there because having Joe go out and provide us, in my state in particular, working with our chairman, uh, has been really a benefit to us. He's helped us build internal capacities that I don't think we could, you know, we'd have to go out in the market and hire a consultant to do that. Um, but, but your thoughts on cyber and where we need to be headed? Well, thank you for that. Uh, we're very lucky to have Joe. Um, well, since you referred to my industry background, I do agree with something the congressman said when he said, like, Boeing doesn't want an accident. The people who run their companies, who run their control centers, do not want a cyber incident. This isn't a government against business thing. Nobody wants a cyber incident. Um, our responsibility um, is with respect to the bulk electric system, you know, 200, basically 200 megawatts and up, or 200 kV and up, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, to, we have in place a set of uh, mandatory standards that are kind of a minimum baseline for good cybersecurity. And beyond that, the states have responsibility and authority for the um, lower voltage and the distribution and the, um, all of the system that goes into the homes and businesses. I think that the, while the mandatory standards are important, the cyber challenges are evolving so quickly, you can't really regulate your way out of them. We can't do a standard fast enough for some new piece of malware or ransomware that comes along. So a lot of the work is in voluntary collaboratives through things like the ESCC and the ESISAC and um, the meetings between AROOC and the state commissioners and FERC. And I think there, we're very much all on the same team in terms of um, finding a way to quickly um, exchange threat information and make the adaptations we all need to in the part of the grid that we regulate. I, I think that the, the non-mandatory piece is becoming more and more important, which is the part that Joe does. You know, we're, we're looking at, you know, tectonic shifts in our, in our power flows and, 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 and our entire generation fleet. There's a lot of questions I've done about uh, 24 hours of interviews in this word clean power plant keeps coming up. Um, where, where do you see us heading with the clean power plant? I'm sorry, that, I mean, could, well, be a, that could be people, a tongue twister. Well, uh, I mean, before um, when we thought there was going to be a clean power plant implemented, we have a memorandum of understanding with the EPA and the DOE to meet and be involved to make sure that we're aware of any issues that are created. Of course, that kind of has been on the shelf since it's been stayed. I think um, the next thing we're waiting for is a decision out of the DC Circuit. They announced decisions, I believe, every Tuesday and Friday. One of these weeks, they're gonna put out an order on the Clean Power Plan. If it's, um, if it's uh, upheld, then I think we'll be looking to the new administration to make any proposals for change that they make and put them through the regulatory process. It seems they're gonna make a change, but I'm not privy to what it is. You know, I'm waiting to see that. I was alarmed, as I said, you know, as a regulatory agency, you know, the FERC is always, the docket's moving, you're doing the safety, you're setting tariffs, you're doing the, the market monitoring. But yet, I, I was really taken back, and, and I say this to you personally because you, you know you are a true custodial leader of the organization. That another federal oh, agency, janitor, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to give you a shout out. <laughs> and so I, I read the trade press one day, and 
at another federal agency taking a swipe at the FERC on pipeline siting. And I personally would say to you that's a sad day that another agency would take a, a, another federal agency to task on their processes and procedures. I think you know what I'm referring to, but I, I mean, where do you see with this administration where we can have the EPA, the DOE, the NRC all kind of working together? Is that, is that a pipe dream? No pun? Is, is, is that a reality? I mean, we all have independent authority. Right. And so in some cases, the regional offices of the EPA have intervened in our dockets and pushed us on certain environmental protections and how we do our environmental review. Um, they're doing it the way you're supposed to do it in the docket. They're not walking up and down First Street with signs. They're um, coming into the docket and pushing us to do what they think is better. And I think they're environmental regulators and I respect that. Um, I would imagine we'll see some sort of changes in emphasis of the EPA, um, but I, I think they'll still be environmental regulators and we'll still be energy regulators and we'll still have that kind of discourse or tension because we're, we're looking at the we're looking at the prism through different faces. We're looking at reliability, safety, how much there is, and they're looking at the species and I mean we not that we don't do that too, but they're strictly environmental regulators. That's their job. Yeah, and, and to pick up on that, they really get you know the right outcomes though. I mean two agencies should talk. Yeah. Right. Well I mean we do you talk? I have had, I, since I've been at FERC, um, I have not had a lot of discussions with the regions of EPA, although I know that FERC projects people have met. I did have a very good relationship with Gina and Joe Goffman and Janet McCabe and the people in DC <coughs> who were kind of my counterparts. And when the new people are sworn in, I, they're not on their first day, but I look forward to meeting them and continuing that relationship. I think we have to have a relationship with PIMSA, with the EPA, with CFTC, with the NRC, where we have a joint meeting in a couple weeks, because they all regulate aspects of the same things that we regulate, just like we need to have a relationship with the state regulators. Um, government is complicated. There's no like one, when I got nominated for FERC, nobody had ever heard of it. So people say, oh, oh, the energy, so you're gonna do that thing, you know, the." out in the bay near New Orleans with, you know, we don't actually do have anything to do with oil spills. So, so you're gonna do the nuclear power plants? No, that's not really us either. So, oh, so you're gonna do like the energy bills and all that, that's really more done in Boston. Well, there's a lot of different people who touch this and we have to have a relationship. You know how I explained it to my lacrosse moms back in Chester County, Pennsylvania? I said, you, uh, did you take Uber? I said, yes. I said, you get a gas bill? Yes. You get electric bill? Yes. Think of me when your rate goes up. <laughs> <laughs> That's simple, right? We do very unpopular things, but for without us, you wouldn't have safety and you wouldn't have regulation. So we have about 50 seconds here, and I'm going to open it up for a question for the chairman. And don't be bashful. We have microphones. I know it's early in the morning. It's just the pressure's on. If you feel like you're in a Quaker meeting hall and you feel inspired to get up and ask a question. Will Tom Brady do it again next year? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Uh, first of all, it's hard for me to say 39 is old. Um, I understand in football it is, but I, I hope we have a few new, more. I mean, I know eventually he will retire. That is just inevitable, but I, I hope he has a couple more good years. He seems to be still playing at the top of his game. So. <laughs> Welcome back to Neighborhood. You, uh, you always make the time for us, and uh, we're looking forward to working with you. And, and thank you for what you're doing on behalf of this country. Thank, thank you. So you. Much.
before I introduce my next panel that I'd like them to all come up. Senator Santorum, Jonathan Munkin, President Morose, please join me. segue into a conversation on cyber here this morning, and uh, it's really great uh, to have our good, our, our leader at Nehruk, uh New Jersey BPU <laughs> President uh, uh, Rick Morose, and doing a great job chairing our Critical Infrastructure Committee, and I'm honored to have a dear friend, a fellow, it's like Pennsylvania Day, Rick, Bill Schuster and Rick Santor. Now, Rick Santor, presidential candidate, CNN, U.S. Senator, for my great state, and uh, he's doing a little work around cyber. And uh, Rick, it's great to have you here. Thanks, Rose. And uh, I also want to recognize Jonathan Munkin. For those of you who haven't met Jonathan, you should meet him. Um, my chairman had him in to do a uh, black sky exercise. He's a West Point graduate, uh, served uh, with distinction um, in, in the military, but also um, was, uh, you were state police director in Illinois. Mm -hmm. so, uh, he just got picked up by PJM, an excellent hire. And uh, but don't do a black sky event with him because it is a scary thing. So <laughs> that's uh, the idea. Yes. And so, Chairman Rose, I'm going to talk to you. We'll get this conversation headed. You're doing a lot of work. As I've done some speeches with the EEI membership and the American Gas Association leadership, is that we have states that are really moving forward with building capacities within their organizations, and you through your leadership, launched an effort to kind of catalog who's doing what. And, and, you know, we have states that are, we'll say, tier one, doing the things that, Jonathan, you would say are cyber, cyber compliant, and then states that are really not doing their fair share or are really investing in, the, in, in cyber capacity building. So talk a little bit about your experience and, and where we're headed as an association on this. And thank you, Rob, for that. Uh, thank you uh, also for your support of uh, my chairmanship and the committee and, and for even doing a panel like this to continue to bring focus to these, these issues. So uh, in the Critical Infrastructure Committee, um, many of you may know what we <coughs> did do is both as an attempt to uh, identify for everyone else, and we talk about information sharing in this realm, but for us, uh, we looked at it as just an opportunity to share what each of our colleagues are doing. Uh, and to give them some resources as to what other commissions and states are doing. So we uh, did do a survey. Um, it is now posted on the website. Um, we still ask all, if the states have not uh, participated in this to provide us the information. We asked some very basic baseline questions. Uh, have the commissions issued orders? Uh, to, the, to what extent do they have a uh, uh, hazard mitigation or emergency management protocol? specifically for cybersecurity, as well as other threats with their emergency management officials and the like, whether they have fusion centers. Uh, and uh, some, of the, some of the results are a bit surprising. We found that not, most of the states actually do have a, a fusion center of some sort. So uh, states are, are taking this seriously. Um, on the other hand, you know, we, we hear this from our colleagues that um, they don't know what the best practices are, what's working elsewhere. So really this is focused on what the committee is going to continue to do is to, to update that information so that we can share that with each other um, and with our federal partners as well so we can uh, identify for each other what's working uh, and hopefully to give each other the support as we continue to do this challenge. And, and we heard earlier from Chairman LaFleur, I mean, the outreach of the FERC has been very helpful to the states, but as she said that you know, the, the Boeing analogy kind of stuck with me, Boeing was going to build planes and fall out of the sky. And Rick, this is a great segue for you. I mean, you served with distinction in, in the Congress, and, you know, probably during your time, we were, our, our defense posture was, you know, a, a, you know, had a, had a little war. Now we have this new, new trend of cyber attacks. We're not launching nukes at each other or pointing nukes at each other. We're, we're dealing with cyber attacks. And the, fear, the most fearful one is attack on the default power system. Um, where, where do you see this dialogue on cyber going? New administration, um, you know, the, the leadership in this House and Senate taking up cyber as kind of a, a national priority. Yeah, I mean, I think it is it is a front burner issue, and and, and will continue. I, my my big concern is, uh, do we have 
personnel to be able to deal with this. I mean, there's a huge shortage right now uh, in, in cyber security personnel. I think it's a million and a half, and in the next two years, it's going to go to three million. Uh, and and we, I don't think we've really gotten our head around that. Not not just in the private sector, but even in the public sector. I mean, in the public sector, uh, you know, we have a lot of people doing cyber. But if you think about if you think about who your cyber your cyber warrior is in in, in Washington D.C., I mean these are these are basically technologists, and these are people who you know went to school for computer science or a whole variety of other things, and they're the people who are are quote war fighters, or they're not trained as war fighters, they're trained as technologists, and yet they're in the they're in the they're in the middle of a battle, and. They don't have the war fighting capability uh, to, you don't have too many people who are trained as army rangers who are in cyber. And so they don't take the approach of, uh, of how do we comprehensively deal with this problem? And I think one of the problems I see, and the, you know, as a political candidate in, in dealing with these threats that we deal with, is that we seem to be just thinking, how do we defend ourselves? And instead of, how do we really put a strategy together to, uh, to attack the enemy to make sure they aren't attacking us? In other words, to keep them, you know, the old, the old idea is, you know, the best defense is a good offense, right? And, and so there is a perspective that I'm hoping the Trump administration, I've talked to some in that administration, take, which is we shouldn't just be about how do we protect ourselves, but how do we deter? And one of the, re one of the ways you deter is, is to be a little bit more lean forward. And again, I think that merger of technologists and war fighting uh, is, is part of the real challenge that we have inside the government. Outside the government and into the private sector, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, I'm not too sure we want you know, co corporations out there attacking you know, those who might, who might attack them. But I think we have to start thinking about innovative ways in which to deter people from, from, uh, from coming at us. So there's, there has to be a, a real a change of thinking. And number two, we just have, we have to have better and more trained individuals to deal with this problem. And uh, one of the suggestions that, I, that, that I've talked about with some folks on the Hill is, is maybe retasking the National Guard. Uh, because we need, we need these people out across America uh, to be sort of like, almost like a Minutemen type of operation to be able to respond to some of these threats that we have. And, and I just don't think we have sufficient personnel within our, within our government to be able to do that. Well, well said, and Jonathan uh, is a proud West Point grad, and I'll give you a shout out. Uh, great win in Baltimore this year. Thank you. Trust me, that was a long time coming, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I, I watched many games at the link where there was fumbles on the ten yard line with a minute to go. So, yes. congrats there. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. And, and congratulations on your new job. Uh, you know, I, I uh, you have been like Joe McClellan out there preaching the gospel to states about, hey guys, you, you gotta really take this seriously. You gotta invest, you've gotta build these internal capacities. Um, and, and you know, you came, you have a state perspective. I mean, you, you worked in the state in the state of Illinois. Um, and, and to pick up on, on Senator Santorum's point, um, you know, as we say, there's a lot of knowns and there's a lot of unknowns in this business. And um, so, so where, where, do you, where do we need to be headed as a neighboring community around cyber? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, the point was very well taken in terms of what the cyber workforce looks like right now. And I think one of the best ways to try and address that problem is trying to identify and deconflict what the lanes of effort are. And that's where I think the states play a significant role because there are, there's a broad spectrum of assets that are potentially available to leverage in these types of circumstances. And some of those things are, are capabilities that industry can provide internally. There's a, a very rapidly growing cyber mutual assistance capability within the electricity sector. Uh, we have almost 90 companies signed up for right now and kind of scoping out what, this, what that looks like and what types of capabilities that entails. Uh, but it absolutely necessitates that government partnership in order to execute at the federal and most importantly at the state level because when you recognize that the majority of the impacts are felt locally, right, all disasters are local and cyber is no exception to that rule, I think there's a significant space to play in right there to make sure that it's clearly defined roles and responsibilities of who's best suited to do what. And if you don't have enough people to meet every particular need, then it speaks to the even greater importance of understanding what are the unique capabilities, how do those line up with both the strategies of defense and deterrence that need to be part of a holistic cybersecurity strategy. So 
I think there's a lot of space to play in there from the neighborhood community, not to mention the fact that nowhere <laughs> is the phrase more literal about the chain is only as strong as its weakest link as it pertains to cyber. And that's a significant role that the states play and the neighborhood potentially plays of making sure that those weak links are as strong as they can possibly be, recognizing that you need to raise the lowest common denominator from a cyber perspective to make sure that everybody's playing their respective part, recognizing the fact that our systems are interconnected, that our, our IT configurations are very, very similar. They're not identical. It's not that you breach one and you get access to everybody, um, but it's not like there's that many different EMS providers out there. It's just a handful of systems. And the architectures are very similar. So I see a lot of space to play in there, and I, and I think that the states have a very significant role in that. And Rick, you, you have been working closely with, with your governor and, and talked about fusion centers. I know in our state, Chairman Brown kind of launched an initiative where we're, where we're doing read-ins and we have staff on the ground. But uh, you know the, the, the importance of these fusion centers, and Jonathan, you may want to pick up on it. I'm, Hopefully, going to tour the one in Topeka, Kansas, Topeka, Kansas, which I heard is world class. But you know the importance these fusion centers play in helping us as state regulators get this information and, and how we avert some of these bad actors in the space. Right. So uh, in New Jersey, uh, uh, the efforts we undertook with the um, with the companies with our uh, board order we did uh, last year uh, dovetailed with what was a state initiative across the, all industries with our uh, Attorney General, our Department of Homeland Security, our Chief Technology Officer, and our Governor, uh, Chris Christie, stood up at the, the Fusion Center last year. So this was part of a comprehensive statewide approach to uh, uh, battling the challenge of cybersecurity across all industries. So we very uh, directly went at this with uh, the utilities uh, in our board order, uh, required them to become a member of the Fusion Center. But the Fusion Center is 24-7 operating as analysts, and they're taking information on all threats to all industries and pushing that out to all the members. So it's part of a more comprehensive approach to attacking, uh, to meeting the challenge of cybersecurity in our state. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely like to pick up on the thread because I think the Fusion Center system is a very, very necessary and very, in many cases, underutilized resource when we talk about what it looks like from that public-private partnership. There's 74 fusion centers nationally. Every state is required by law to have one at least. But as you'll notice, the number's higher than the number of states, and that's because there's a lot of urban areas that have them as well. So take Pennsylvania as an example. You have a fusion center in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and one for the state. Um, but they don't necessarily always talk to each other, which is one of those challenges that needs to be overcome at the state level, trying to find ways to share that information. And each fusion center is organized a little bit differently. Some of them work for the state police, some of them work for uh, a Department of Homeland Security, some of them work for the National Guard, depending on where they're organized and how they fall within the state chain. Understanding that is very, very valuable to the process, but at its very core, the single greatest mitigating strategy for cybersecurity threats is information sharing. So as the saying goes, there's two types of companies, those have been breached and those that don't know it yet. And in this particular context, you, uh, it, I've seen this slogan before, it may be that your life only serves as a warning to others. So you always need to be very mindful of the fact that if you have a cybersecurity related issue, the worst thing that you can do is not tell anyone about it. And the fusion centers are specifically purpose built in order to share that type of information across intelligence silos, across government and private sector. So understanding how to access that resource and utilize that resource is hugely valuable, especially when you talk about the interdependent systems of infrastructure that for a variety of different reasons, could, it could be legal hurdles, it could be antitrust regulations, that we don't necessarily share information in an open form as often as we could or potentially should. And the fusion centers provide that, that vehicle, that, that means, that mechanism to be able to allow us to do that. And that takes a collective effort. That's definitely not something that you flip the switch on tomorrow, everybody shares openly and this is terrific, it really needs to be a deliberate process of trying to identify what the most critical intelligence is and how can it be incorporated into the existing processes of sharing that happens at the state level. I'm going to come back to Senator Santorum on this issue of information sharing, but tell a quick story, speaking of, of uh, beware of what you say. EEI member company that I happen to regulate was very proud of their cyber effort. They were brought into a congressional hearing to talk about it. The CEO said, don't overhype what we're doing, we'll become a target. Literally. 
Dumb it down. Don't 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 put a bullseye on your back because we're doing the boring good and we're investing and we're out there. But don't brag about it because the, 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 the payback will be, you know. That's exactly right. I mean, I, I think that's when it comes down to targeting. Right. People are looking for for places to target. Uh, ideally, what you want is to strike the right balance of understanding that we're taking the proactive efforts. We're doing what needs to be done as often and as as well as we possibly can to protect the systems. Uh, but the last thing that you need is an additional target. And, and I think the energy sector right now, what we're seeing is the pivot that's happened just in the last 18 months is the single most frequently attacked infrastructure sector in the United States is energy. And the root cause of that is not necessarily us kind of out there saying that, well, we're, we're the best at cybersecurity, but I think what's become really implicit now and from a societal standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from an industrial standpoint is that we are so much more reliant on electricity now from a societal or an economic perspective than we ever have been before. It makes the most sense. It makes the most sense. And, and that's something that we have to recognize, not as the, the precursor, the hair breaker of doom, uh, but really as a call to action as to why this is important work and why it needs to be guided by a steady hand and a collaborative strategy and not as a one-off, well, there's 6,400 companies and they all do it differently. That's not an acceptable model of practice when it comes to addressing these issues. Coming back, and, and, and we talk about information sharing, and Rick, you've spent a little bit of time in this town. <laughs> and the FBI, CIA, CIA, Defense Logistics Agency, DOD, FERC, all these agencies that are kind of playing in cyber, and it, it concerns us, it's a silo mentality. So, we hear that President Trump is going to issue, hopefully, an executive order around cyber. And you know, your view: what, what, how can we break down the silos? And how, how, you know, here we are, state regulators, looking for that guidance from above, saying, "Here it is. Here's the roadmap." And all you federal agencies start coordinating with the states. Uh, I was involved with a company, uh, and involved with a company that's that's doing uh, cybersecurity, and uh, one of the principals of that company was in, involved in doing a little demonstration to one of the federal agencies and while doing this demonstration, uh, you know, in just an open source, uh, they were able to say, you know, look, we can find things out there, you know, before, before the attack happens. And they actually found something in, in this demonstration. And, uh, you know, someone stood up from an agency and just said, we gotta shut this down. This isn't under our titles and authorities to be able to look at this. And, and someone stood up and said, well, I have the title and authority, we can continue to look at this. And so they pursued it. Long story short, they actually, our, our guy was involved within the agencies and, and, and was able to, to pinpoint a, an, an attack that was, that was underway. Um, and it wasn't stopped. And the reason it wasn't stopped was no one had the authority to do it. And, and not, not, that's what they said. The bottom line is, if you have all these agencies who have authority over it, but no one has responsibility, to take the authority, then takes the blame. And so if you actually proactively do something, then you're responsible if something, doesn't, if something goes wrong. If you don't do anything, then it's shared problem. So we have a problem with all of these different agencies having authority, and no one has responsibility. And so there is, there is something that an administration must do to create some line of responsibility so that actions take place because bureaucrats, and no offense to the bureaucrats among us here, but you don't, get in, you don't get in trouble for not doing things, particularly if it's not clear it's your responsibility. And you do get in trouble for taking on something and having it fail. So there's all the incentives not to do. And so that, that is a huge, huge problem within not just this area, within government generally, but we're talking about pretty high stakes here. And, and it is, because it cuts across almost everything we do in government, it is diffused. And as a result, I think we're much more vulnerable. John, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, you bet, absolutely. I think it's, it, it speaks to kind of that lean definition as well of where the skills reside and what the capabilities are. So take PJM or any power company. We're, we, we're an organization of 650 employees. We cannot and should not uh, be under the mistaken impression that it's our implicit responsibility to defend against China, Russia, 
North Korea, Iran, any of these advanced persistent threats or nation state actors, therein lies the driving purpose behind the necessity of partnerships, recognizing that there's capabilities at the federal level and state level within DOD, within the three letter agencies, to have a better understanding of what those threats are, have a better understanding of what those tactics, techniques, and procedures that are being utilized, and sharing that so that we can improve our defensive systems. And at the same time, what we can provide as a resource in a two-way partnership, because it needs to be both directions, is the rare knowledge that exists about industrial control systems and SCADA, things that are of use to those intelligence agencies, to the Department of Defense, as they scope out their missions, both defensive and offensive, recognizing that they need to rely on subject matter expertise that's not just laying around on the ground and you just get to pick it up and it's very easy to find. So the partnership, I think, in many ways is very natural, but it's also absolutely essential uh, that it happens in that way. So when it comes down to that responsibility, I think that's a great defining point. And right now, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is uh, the FAST Act was referenced this morning. Well, there are authorities implicit for the Secretary of Energy outlined in the FAST Act about the ability to declare a grid emergency. And that can include cyber. Well, what exactly does that mean? It also includes uh, the definition of an, an imminent threat. Well, there's a lot of arguments that can be made that we're currently involved in an imminent threat from a cybersecurity risk perspective within the electricity industry. And I'm not asking for a declaration today. Uh, but what I think was important there is that exercises like GridX, as an example, go a long way to trying to gain a depth, an improved depth of understanding, breadth of understanding of the policy implications implicit in things like cyber attacks and whose responsibilities they are in terms of what we should anticipate to receive at the state and federal level as a company and what we would be expected to provide. And the list is extensive and it needs that continued process of coordination. And I'd much rather find that out of an exercise than in a real world. You know, we, uh, I'll never forget, I was in a building in Philadelphia with, uh, with colleagues from the Mid-Atlantic region. We had Congressman Pat Me in there, and we just kind of launching this tri-state collaborative, just a new thing of what, and an FBI agent saying, you know, I just want you all to know, it's not a question of when. It, it, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, excuse me. And we all looked at each other, and he said, so for the conversation going forward, and this was back in 2014, you know, states, and Rick, you, you picked up on this, I mean, states now more than ever need to, to really ramp up. And Jonathan, you've done this outreach, the, uh, the dark sky event, which is really a gloomy scenario. I mean, you think people, we all know as regulators, people get upset when they don't have electric power, but when they don't have water, it's a different outreach. So, um, or as we learned, Rick, from, from Hurricane Katrina, or excuse me, Sandy, uh, people who don't have access to petroleum products and, and the like. So, Rick, in your view, Rick Murrow, sorry, uh, the state's, uh, you know, your assessment of, you know, and, and its collaborative work and relationship with the feds, and Cheryl talked about it, I mean, we all have been blessed to have someone like Joe McClellan out there working with us, but, you know, your views of what, what's the next generation of this for, for the states? Well, uh, all the states have to be engaged, regulators, us um, on the utility side, but also with our emergency management uh, uh, personnel or, or officials. And it is to look to the future, um, not to look back or look at what we identify the problems as the Senator mentions, we need to figure out what the solutions are. To look forward, it's like, um, rather than looking back at Tom Brady, let's, let's talk about Carson Wentz. <laughs> yes. Amen. So, so those of you that aren't from the Delaware Valley, he's the quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. You're from North Dakota. And a rookie. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sure. Uh, so, so we gotta look to the future. What, and, and the first question that we need to be asking, and this is actually something that was embedded in the um, uh, cybersecurity primer that was just reissued uh, a couple weeks ago here in Nehru, is to engage, ask questions. Uh, ask questions of the industry, ask questions of your colleagues in emergency management uh, activities. And one of the questions is that I ask myself, well, what do I do? What, what are the calls I'm gonna get? I know my governor's gonna be calling me, I know I'm gonna have to work with the industry, I'm gonna have to work with my attorney general and the state police and our homeland security, and I, I'm gonna have to talk to the federal folks as well. So it's that first step of what do you do? What, ask yourself that question. How would I react? What am I going to have to do? Where am I gonna be? What resources do I need? 
So it's some very basic questions that we need to ask ourselves and then ask others in the industry that we regulate and our colleagues that we would have to interact with during that uh, period. One of the concerns that, that we as state regulators that I've heard from our colleagues, Rob, is, um, is this, this and when we ask that question, it is still really not clear to us exactly how we will interact with those resources at the federal level. Um, uh, as uh, you point out, Joe McClellan and, and, and the FERC uh, uh, commissioners and staff are very good, uh, have great resources, but they're also resources that are could and would be deployed from others. So we need to make sure we need to be clear about what that is. In our committee, um, Commissioner Wagner asked a question of whether we could have something in a uh, in a short order, a menu of what resources will be available if we have to call upon them in the event of an, in an incident. By the way, when Chris Christie really yell at you, you were classmates at University of Delaware. Do you do you know my governor? <laughs> <laughs> I That's but I, I've known him for 35 years, yes. and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'll just to pick up on a quick thread there at the at the state level. I think something that I saw both at Illinois State Police and then in, at the Illinois Emergency Management Agency was that having a, a consolidated state cybersecurity strategy is something that's hugely important, both to define those levels and roles of responsibility for who's doing what. Um, but also trying to understand that, as you said, with resource sharing, it's a great example. So states provide, in any disaster, the vast majority of resources provided are not federal assets. They're state-to-state -state shared assets. And in this particular space, looking at something like the Emergency Management Assistance Compact and its potential applicability for public utility commissions, for sharing resources, for understanding how state resources can be shared. Senator Santorum brought up a great point about the National Guard. There's 10 cyber protection teams that are in the process of being stood up around the country that are under the purview of the National Guard. And those are governor's assets that can be shared from state to state. And knowing what those assets are, how they can be accessed, and what the process looks like is very, very important. Not to mention the fact that EMAC is a unique <laughs> system because it doesn't have adjudication authority built into it. It's a governor to governor and request. It's not, no one steps in and says, you get it and you don't. It depends on who asks. So he who knows the system best has the greatest ability to access those resources and those types of conversations are very, very important. You know, we got a little bit of time here this morning and I think uh, what I'd like to do is, is open it up for questions from the floor. So we're gonna pass some microphones around and our former, former fur commissioner, <laughs> Wisconsin Badger, Bronco Turkovic. A great name. Thank you, but I'm going to ask a question as a former CEO. If somebody comes into my building armed, uh, I can call the police. Uh, they will, uh, you know, it's an attack. Somebody kidnaps my employees. The federal government comes in. If somebody kidnaps my computer system, is, shouldn't there be a state or federal law that says that some authority can come in and help me cure that situation? Yeah, so I think you've got, I mean, you do have significant authorities in terms of what resources are accessible to you. And this is, this is a great example of what the Senator was referring to is not a lack of authorities available, but a good understanding of exactly what the right authority or the right entity is to address that particular issue. So FBI in a lot of ways has rightfully cornered the market on cyber crime in terms of what they have the responsibility for. And that's potentially a resource that's available to an individual company to be able to request that. When you've had a breach, you can reach out to the local Joint Terrorism Task Force and bring that in. Generally speaking, I think power companies have good relationships with their FBI field offices because they recognize that in particular. But I think what you reference uh, has a lot of bearing on the process of research, of understanding what types of capabilities are available to you. If you're a power company, do you need the Department of Homeland Security ICS search? industrial control system, computer emergency response team. Um, is it a capability that you need? Is it a, uh, do you have a cyber crime issue as compared to a cyber sabotage issue? Is it related to malware or ransomware? There's so many different things and that's what needs to be discussed in advance. So I think it's a very appropriate question of making sure that for each of the states that the companies within their state know, hey, if this is the type of problem you have, you do have a single throat to grab at the state level that can immediately assist you in finding the right resource with the right authority to bring to bear. Let me just make one more observation about an answer to that question, though. 
that I think the question presumes that there's no self-help, that the company hasn't thought through what they have to do. It's our position, and this is at least my perspective in New Jersey as the regulator, we're telling, we're telling the industry they have to come with us with their plan. It is their responsibility to determine how they will respond to that kind of event. Now certainly the FBI is the first step in that process from a law enforcement standpoint, but in terms of securing that asset, that operation, that's the responsibility of the company, and they have to figure out what they need, and that's what we're asking the industry to do in this setting. It's a very quiet group this morning. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> it's not going to be quiet any longer. Yes, it's quiet. Oh, from, the, from the Virgin Islands. Good morning, sir. Good morning, John. The, uh, the question's actually a follow up, but <clears throat> I know at NARU we have a a committee on critical infrastructure. But when we have that attack and we say we're gonna go back to the company, it seems to be a disconnect when we talk about telecommunications infrastructure. Because when we look at, are we having that authority, do the public, do our regulators have authority over wireless and cable and telecommunications as the place to go to? So it seems to me there's a disconnect as we look at our infrastructure as regulators that there's no place for people to go because different states have different authority over the very means of cyber uh, attacks that are going to confront us. Well, Jonathan, I think you need to pick up on this, but I'll give you just, uh, John, a, a quick observation just Pennsylvania. I mean, state police, if you ask them five years ago, you know, you know where's, the, where's Homer City coal plant? Or where's this reservoir? That that's not in their purview. They didn't, you know, they, they can monitor highways and, and other, you know, urban centers, suburban communities where there's depots. And and now comes this this uh, collaboration and interfacing with public utility commission. So in our case, and Rick, I think you're in the same boat, putting personnel on the ground. So when this particular piece of physical asset, energy asset, comes up and there's through the fusion center, they're identifying a trend of potential cyber threat that the commission has the ability to, to collaborate. And someone told me, in the old days of law enforcement was a bunch of detectives would get together over eggs and bacon and cigarettes and say, what do you know about this? Well, the evolution of fusion centers has changed the way we do crime mapping in this country. And it's actually been a great success story in terms of performance measurement and, and, and bringing about reductions in crime, but to the cyber piece, I mean, having, having PUCs engaged and at those facilities, I think has been a game changer. Jonathan, from your perspective. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I can tell you even from an emergency manager's perspective, every state has to complete what's called a file, a threat and hazard identification and risk assessment. It's required, otherwise they receive no federal grants for Homeland Security or emergency management. What's fascinating to me is I know in, in my four years of, of overseeing the development of that document, we did not involve the private industry in it, not deliberately, because we were trying to play keep away. And the result of that was not understanding what kind of critical infrastructure is out there. We understand kind of what's inside our own house, right? What is government critical infrastructure and that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, more often than not, we don't realize what's critical until we're in a circumstance that it raises it to the very, very top uh, as a major issue. So whether it's, you know, we had a circumstance where there was a, a flood and we didn't realize that at and single switching station for the entire southern third of the state was threatened by the flood. We didn't know that until the water was right there. And from a cyber perspective, you do not want to find yourself in that circumstance where the relative criticality of infrastructure within your own state is unknown to the entities at the state level that have the greatest responsibility to assist in the process of protecting it and will provide resources and response and recovery to it. And I think that's important from an energy infrastructure standpoint, uh, from a pipeline uh, standpoint, and certainly from a communication standpoint, because all of our power companies are completely reliant on commercial communications technology to operate the grid. And that's something that, that really needs to be discussed on a regular basis, not just when the disaster happens, but well in advance. And to that point, that's where governors really raise their voices when, you know, how could this happen? What was your planning protocols? You better have a good answer, right? How did we get here? How did we get here? Yeah. Uh-oh, time is up. I could do another hour with these guys, Regina. 
No? No. Oh. That looks like a hard no. <laughs> Please join me in thanking this panel. Here. Everybody have a great day. We look forward to seeing you at our committee lunches today. Thank you very much.